Hey dickheads! We have searched the Scanalyzer and found a few fragments of information that will be helpful for you on the book Stand on Zanzibar, the John Bruner classic. I know it's not Philip K. Dick, but we think John Bruner is pretty dick adjacent. So, here today I have a special guest. Dwayne, tell everybody who you are and what you do. Hi, my name is Dwayne. I am a writer and editor. I am editor-in-chief of the Planet X Publications line of books, and a writer of many obscure gems. Right, so the reason why I have recruited Dwayne for this particular bonus episode of Dickheads is because the other two dickheads are not brunettes like we are. They're not big John Bruner fans, but uh, John Bruner is definitely one of my favorite writers, and uh, we're going to give you a little background on him, but Dwayne, how did you discover John Bruner, and then I'll tell you how I did. I was in Crocs and Brentano's bookstore in Oak Brook, Illinois, and I was 11 years old and trying to decide what book to buy. Next door to Dahlgren was Stand on Zanzibar, and I liked the Murray Tinkleman cover. Hmm. Well, you know, it's funny. It's a used bookstore where I found John Bruner, too, and it was would have been in Indiana, so one state over. Uh, it was Caveat Emptor Books, and I, you know, always skim the science fiction books there for Delray books because when I was uh, young, pretty much Delray was my, you know, my automatic go-to. Like I assumed that if it had Delray on the spine, it was going to be something pretty good. And I believe the first one that I read was Crucible of Time. And the just ah. the the sheer insanity of that book just blew me away, and so that was that was my first Bruner. And what's interesting, why we're doing Stand on Zanzibar, is that I've been reading Bruner for I don't know since the '90s, but I knew Stand on Zanzibar was his classic, but I kept saving it. I kept saying like, when's the I, I wanted it for like a flight to Europe or something. Uh, <laughs> So I kept not reading it, and then this year I just decided I had waited long enough, and and I, I did read it on a flight uh, home to Indiana and back to see my father, but I, I had held off reading Stand on Zanzibar for all this time. But, you know, what's really interesting, too, is that for me, um, I got back into, I read that Crucible of Time, John Bruner, but when I really dove into John Bruner was in San Diego, we had invited a uh, radical environmentalist, uh, Rod Pernado, who had sunk whaling ships, to speak in San Diego, and he was selling the sheep look up from his table. <laughs> and I was like, well, I know John Bruner. And then so I went through a second phase because I was like, well, this radical environmentalist is selling this book. That's got to be interesting. <laughs> and uh, He was a trainite, huh? Yes, yeah, and um, apparently for a while the Earth First movement was was selling the Sheep Look Up uh, for several years, like the, the reprint edition. But anyways, that's a uh, a, a whole other topic. But we will get into some environmental issues with Stan on Zanzibar. We can't avoid it. But so some background on John Bruner for those who don't know. I really believe John Bruner is just as brilliant as Philip K. Dick. He didn't, um, he didn't get quite the attention. I mean, he did in the sci-fi community. He won the Hugo. He won the, you know, the Nebula. He, he, he won all the major awards and he definitely had a lot of respect in sci-fi. Now he started off writing a lot of like, um, weird space operas and a lot of books about slavers and pirates. And this, this book, kind of kicked off, Shannon Zanzibar kind of kicked off a, a trilogy of more serious science fiction that um, was followed up with uh, Shockwave Rider and The Sheep Look Up, which are considered generally his his trilogy of, of masterpieces. Um, I've read all three now. Uh, Dwayne, you've read all three, right? I have. There's also a couple more that are loosely grouped in there. Um, Jagged Orbit and Children of the Thunder. Yeah, I have Children of the Thunder sitting in my TBR right now. It's going to be the next Bruner I read. And, uh. Um, Excellent. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to that one. And then, uh, Jagged Orbit I intend to read this year. This year is going to be a retro sci fi year for me. So I want to read. Awesome. Yeah, some Cordwainer Smith, some Barry Maltzberg. Uh, I've read some Le Guin, but I've got to read some, um, some, uh, James Triptree, aka Alice. 
what was her last name? Uh, Sheldon. Sheldon, yeah. And then th- those are like high on my list. So, but getting back to Brunner, I know the Jagged Orbit and Children of Thunder are definitely considered some of the higher class of, of Brunner's, but, you know, some of his, um, some, some of his, like, cheesier pulp ones still sound pretty good. I know I, I thought about reading The Stone That Never Came Down and Double Double both look really good as well. I don't know if you've read those, but. Yes, he also had some more mature stuff as far as outlook and theme before Stand at Zanzibar, like The Squares of the City, which was about chess, mm-hmm. and The Whole Man, a couple of other things. I've read a whole lot of Brunner's novels. Yeah, and I know I read Maze of Death, which was like, I think his last book before he died, and that was really good as well. That was very far future, kind of Dunish. If, mm-hmm. if my memory serves, I, I read that right after Crucible of Time. Um, well, and I'd say Crucible of Time is a very well-respected novel as well. Um, mm-hmm. It's not for everybody, because <laughs> Crucible of Time is probably his weirdest book. It's definitely out there. And uh, Although Shockwave Rider, which kind of presupposes the internet, and yeah. it's like pre-cyberpunk cyberpunk, Shockwave Rider is fucking weird. That book is really weird. Good, but very weird. <laughs> but yeah, it, it, you know, so we definitely think that dickheads would enjoy branching out into John Bruner if they haven't already. So. Sure, especially if you're looking at the cyberpunk angle where Shockwave Rider, as you say, is the progenitor. Yeah. Although it's mostly about phone booking instead of the internet. Uh, Bruner and uh, PKD were friendly. They saw each other at conventions, and they respected each other's work. Bruner wrote an introduction to at least one of PKD's short story collections. So mm-hmm. so they definitely had respect for each other. Um, and the best of Philip K. Dick Bruner wrote the intro- introduction to. That's right. Yeah. I got this a great quote from Bruce Sterling, who's, of course, uh, one of the original cyberpunks, uh, from his introduction to Stand on Zanzibar. And I thought this was a great quote about Bruner the person. And he said, Bruner was older and wiser than the hippie sci-fi kids clustered around London's New World's magazine, the tie-dye global focus of the new wave. Though no fault of his own, Bruner had arrived at a roaring, out-of-control hashish party... At somewhat the wrong time, Bruner was no longer young enough to be authentically spontaneous, naive, flipped out, and psychedelic. He had too much seasoned, e-trude, oh, I don't even know that word, and street smarts. <laughs> he chose to jam it all into a Paisley New Wave package, a package that split at the seams. So that was Bruce Sterling. I think, you know, if you look at, there's there are a couple interviews out there from Bruner, like especially, um, you know, archived interviews, and he was, like, a very kind of traditional British man, but he definitely cut it loose in his fiction, that's for damn sure. <laughs> so, mm-hmm. yeah, and I really appreciate that about him. Uh, Stan Zanzibar is still in print. It was the uh, probably the most famous publication of it was the 1983 Delray Books edition, but it was first published in 1968, and it won the Hugo Award for Best Novel, the Nebula Award. It was a nominee for be- it was a nominee for the Nebula Award, but it won the British Science Fiction Award for Best Novel, and that was the first time the award was given. So right out of the gate, it also won the French Apollo Award for the French Sci Fi Award. Uh, the pre Apollo, yeah. Yeah, the pre Apollo. You know, one of the things that's interesting about the fact that it it won that year is I guess there was a lot of debate um, between a lot of people thought that Arthur C. Clarke's novelization of 2001, A Space Odyssey, should have won. Now, keep in mind, he wrote that um, at the same time the movie was in production. So it's 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 a little different from the movie. It's it's not a traditional novelization. It's not point by point by the screenplay. But a lot of people thought that Arthur C. Clarke's uh, novel should have should have won the Hugo, and and it really presents an interesting dichotomy of, you know, what somebody considers valuable in science fiction at the time. Because Stand on Zanzibar is the very different book from 2001. They are not similar in any way, shape, or form. <laughs> I, I don't know. If it, what do you think about that? The, the difference? Because I think that Stand on Zanzibar is 
you know, says so much. I mean, I mean, obviously, I like 2001 as a novelization or, or as a novel. I appreciate all of Clark's books. I'm, I am a Clark fan, but I do think that over the test of time, even though the movie makes 2001 more, one that people remember more, I think Stan and Zanzibar was more deserving of the Hugo. What do you think, Dwayne? I don't disagree at all. Stan and Zanzibar is, to my mind, one of the two or three best science fiction novels ever. It's certainly important, and it's certainly amazingly prophetic. I mean, we basically live in the world that it describes right now. Yeah, yeah, I really, I can't disagree with it being up in the top five um, novels, and it certainly is better than... Clark's 2001, but um, I read an article yesterday, a really great article by mutual Facebook friend, uh, writer, publisher James Reich, who wrote, uh, has a novel, Soft Invasions, and he's the editor of Stocking Horse Press. And he wrote an article for a book on 60s British science fiction called Inner Space Odyssey, Suburban Spacemen and the Cults of, of Catastrophes. And he has a quote about this debate between... 2001 and Stan on Zanzibar. And he said, In 1968, it was literary in ways and intentions that Arthur C. Clarke's bestseller of the same year simply was not. Even with the benefit of Stanley Kubrick's psychedelia, neither Clarke nor Burgess, who was nominated for a novel that year, are as trippy as the visualization by Kubrick. Stan and Zanzibar earned a Hugo Award in 1968 in the inaugural British Science Fiction Association Award the following year. Because, and, and what he's basically saying is in part because it had a weirdness that that book just didn't have, right? It just, it, mm -hmm. and it had like an edge that, that nothing that Arthur C. Clarke would ever do would have. And that edge was, I think, so important for, um, why this book was, was so important at the time. You know, and, and it's really interesting that, um, you know, we look back on it now and some of the Hugo Awards, I don't know that we remember the books as well, but I think Stand on Zanzibar is one where we look back and like, yeah, they got it right <laughs> that year. That, that's one that really deserved it. It is. It gets more credit as time goes on. Right. And that's one of the funny thing about if you look at like the Sheep Look Up or Stand on Zanzibar is that I remember reading Sheep Look Up in 2006 and saying, wow, this really says a lot about our times today. Wow, it says so much about our times today. But if you read it this year, you can you'll feel the same thing. <laughs> right. Well, see, the, the thing is with the Sheep Look Up, I read that new. Oh, you did. And it's interesting. 40 years later, to look at it, and go, wow, how did that happen? Right. Because it's right there. Avoid this. Don't do this. And we did those things. Right. Right. So um, when did you read Stand on Zanzibar? What's your relationship with that? Oh, yo, you said that was the first one that you read, right? Uh, of Bruno? Yeah, I was 11 years old. And so... So 1971. Okay, so it was three years old at the time. Or the book was three years old or ish. Right. And uh, what was your reaction to reading it in the 70s? I was enthralled. Mm -hmm. I bought everything like it. I had encountered Bruner the year before when I read Dangerous Visions the first time. Mm. He had a story in there. And so I recognized his name from there when I went shopping for books for the best bang for the buck book. Like I described, Stan and Zanzibar was right there. And I brought that home. And as it happens, on my father's bookshelf was a copy of John Dos Passos USA, which oh, Stan wow. on Zanzibar is patterned after as far as the format. Right. And that was mentioned in the review in Fantasy and Science Fiction by Algis Boudris of that book. Mm -hmm. So I read Dos Passos right after Stan on Zanzibar instead of the other way around like anybody else would have read it. Now, that's interesting because I haven't read that book, but um, did you... How did it inform reading Dos pa the, the USA trilogy? How did reading Stan Zanzibar inform you for reading that, going that way. Well, it, I was used to the format in the first place, and um, USA has that sort of partially letter-driven, newspaper article-driven sort of a format, as well as the chop-up Burroughsian format, which is amazing considering I think it was written in like 1921 or something like that. Wow, yeah. So, 
That, yeah, I didn't realize that book was that old. I thought it was from the 40s, but I guess it was from the from the Depression era then. Yeah, that's... Wow. I think so. Right. So, Bruner made a point that one of the things that he really wanted to say with this book, and I had this quote from him where he said, With the passage of years, I became more and more cynical about the possibilities of contemporary technology. Back in the 30s and 40s, big questions were things like, can we liberate nuclear energy? Can we send a rocket to the moon? And subsequently, of course, after we've done these things, the central question became, if we're so clever, why aren't we smart? In other words, why can't, if we can do marvelous things, why can't we live together in a sane society? Mm -hmm. So I think a lot of the theme, what he's saying there is that, you know, a lot of people will point and say, oh, it's a book about overpopulation. And that's true. But not so much in the way that, like, Harry Harrison's uh, Make Room, Make Room was. It's not as directly about overpopulation so much as it, it, it's about the overcrowding of society, not necessarily just yeah. overpopulation directly. What you would call the rat pack effect is what it's describing. Right. You take a bunch of rats and you put them in the terrarium and they begin eating each other just because of being overcrowded. And that's where the premise came from. Right, and a lot of the wonderful things in this book, like, because there's a lot been made about all the predictions and the things that Brunner got right. And and we should point out the the Bradbury quote about how science fiction isn't meant to predict the future as much as it is to prevent it a lot of times, especially in dystopias. And, Mm -hmm. um, but it's amazing how much Brunner got correct here. And for me, the two things that that just hit me when I was reading it because I didn't read any articles about what it predicted before I read it was when I got to the part where he was basically talking about school shootings and mass shootings. And I was just floored anyways, uh, you know, the school shooting part. And then the part where he mentions that Detroit had become a ghost town because the the Mm -hmm. means productions cars have changed. That, those were the two parts that most floored me. How about you for the, the predictive, the, the predictive powers of Bruner in this book? Well, parallel to that, the whole idea of mucking that he had brought up there, where the people in the Philippines were going nuts with yada kangs and chopping each other up and all that, that is parallel to that track. Um, as part of the rat pack effect where they're eating each other, the thing he got wrong about that was it wasn't in America, it was in the Philippines. Right. Where he saw it being overcrowded like that. But still, the the concept holds true, and the unrest in Polynesia, he got perfectly right, and that's still ongoing, and isn't even covered in this part of the world at all. I know he has New York covered in a dome, and the Vietnam War still going, but I think what you can look at some of that is that we still have ongoing and military-industrial complex, not necessarily just in Vietnam, but um, I think he was basically correct on that, if you, if you just look at it that way. He also kind of presupposed the European Union in this book. And so, you know, those are all pretty impressive things for futurists to, to get correct. And, uh, and all very impressive, especially if you consider this was 1968. And I know my dickheads co-hosts get annoyed with me for, like, constantly saying, for the time, <laughs> you know. But I think when you're reading out of date science fiction, that I think that's essential to think about. Because sure, well, the book was published in '68, but it had to have been written in '65, '66. Probably, yeah. Which is even more surprising. Right, and the other thing that's so important when you're reading uh, science fiction from this is is that you're getting a person from the mid to late '60s, you know, trying to say something about our future and I think that that in itself is valuable like especially somebody who did such a good job of of correctly pointing to some of the ills that we would end up dealing with so now we can talk let's talk a little bit about like the structure this book is not for everybody because some people are going to get lost in how the experimental narrative style which we've already commented was for people who don't know it he took the style from a there was a book that we just we mentioned earlier, the USA trilogy by Don uh, John Don Passos is how it's pronounced. Um, Don Passos. Yeah, and um, this style was to have like 
little bits and pieces of ads, newspaper clippings, poetry, different things to kind of propel the narrative. Now, in, in the case of Stands at Zanzibar, there are three real main characters, Don Hogan the spy, um, Chad Mulligan, who's like kind of the, the famous poet character, who I think is kind of based a little bit on Burroughs, my, my thinking, but I could be wrong. And Somewhere between Burroughs and Ginsburg, it looks pitched. Yeah, exactly. And then, so you've got like all these different styles. So it's not traditional narrative. You can have pages and pages where it's just strung together ideas. But what's really interesting is it's, it's an amazing way to do world building because he does, he does so much to paint the picture of this alternate future that you just get really, really amazing ways to see glimpses of this entire world. What did you think about the narrative structure and style, Dwayne? Then and now. Um, at, the, at the time, I was captivated by it. When I was 11, I didn't understand it. Um, looking back at it from this point, I can see where it is designed to only work in the end. Once you've finished everything, then the puzzle gets put together. Otherwise, it's just all the little puzzle pieces, and you can move them around. And it's been hugely effective on my own writing, which has been modular. I write scene by scene, and scenes can be transported from one book or one story to another, because everything is related. Yeah, and... and Typically influential. Right. Well, and I will say that, this, for me, there certainly there were some that I just... I skipped over, where I just didn't... I knew what... I didn't think it was doing anything for the narrative, personally. Um, so I'm, I'm not going to mm-hmm. lie. There were a few that I was just kind of like, where I'd look at two pages of a poem, and I just... I was like, eh, eh. You got two pages in? Wow. <laughs> <laughs> I can even only get like half a page to a I'm sorry. Right. And, um, you know, there, there's, there's some, some of those fragments are better than others, but, um, you know, I think Bruner himself called it a non novel, which is interesting. <laughs> but I think there's more of a narrative there than some people complain about. And, yes. uh, and I, I think that if you really get into, especially Don Hogan's story, there is definitely a, a through narrative that's that's really good. Oh, there is. And especially contrasted with everything else that was out at the time, which, as you mentioned, 2001, and to Android's Dream of Electric Sheep was out, and out in the theaters was Night of the Living Dead and Planet of the Apes. That whole equal horror sort of narrative was prevalent in society at that time, and Stand on Zanzibar is definitely the premier example of all of that, but it's not the most famous. Right, right. You know, it, it, it's funny because if you, it, he definitely was taking a major step here, and that's one of the reasons why we, we think that the, the Hugo Award was definitely uh, well-earned. And, you know, I, I've been thinking about this. I probably have to read all the Hugos from the 60s this year because since I've already read two of them now, since we just did um, Man in the High Castle for, uh, for Dickheads. And... Um, you know, I I would say for me, seeing this book as a Hugo Award winner, like just for me, reading this book from beginning to end, it it gave me more respect for the Hugos, in a sense. Um, I mean, I always had respect for them, but just saying, like, wow, man, they really got this one right. This is, mm-hmm. you know, I truly do agree with you that it. it and I know um, when I posted my review on on my blog a couple weeks back. I made a point of telling everyone, I don't just think that this is, you know, the best science fiction book of this era. It's it's easily one of the best science fiction books of the 20th century, and most important. Like, um, and it's it's sad that Bruner is, is, you know, hasn't had the popularity or the renaissance that, that PKD had. Um, we certainly... He's certainly worthy of it, um, and I know a lot of it comes down to PKD has had movies made based on his work, but come on, somebody make a Shockwave Rider movie. <laughs> It'll happen. <laughs> People will find this stuff. All right, so we've already, uh, we're have already we already half an hour into this, so let's start talking about the message of the book. I think one of the most important parts of expressing the message of Stand on Zanzibar is um, on page 422, with the, um, ch- there's a, a, a chapter called The Pros and Cons of Lunatic Society, and it's a little context chapter, 
I think it says Context 20 here, and I've got my copy of the book out. You know, it's funny because the lunatic uh, pun is one that uh, Dick made in Second Variety, and I know when we did our episode on uh, Screamers in Second Variety, we just really wanted to... We couldn't stand that pun, but um, here it is again. But uh, there's a quote on that, because this whole section is just a speech that somebody who lives on the moon colony is giving to people on Earth, right? And mm-hmm. this whole speech to me is, is, and I don't know how other people feel about this speech in the book, but just me speaking as a as an environmentalist, this this whole and a space nerd, this whole chapter to me was the was like the essence of the book distilled. Um, because one of the quotes he says is more important than that though is that when you're on the moon, you know you're living in an environment where cooperation is essential for survival. Boom. To me, that is like, you know, I mean, it's a little on the nose, but that's, I mean, it's clear that, that this is the message of the book to me of Stan on Zanzibar and what he's, he's trying to get across. How, how do you feel then and now, um, Dwayne, about the message of the book and what Brunner was trying to say? I don't disagree. I think that's absolutely the idea that cooperation is essential to survival because Everywhere you see things not working right, there are people not cooperating and working at cross purposes. Or that Stan and Zanzibar and the Sheep Look Up were satire. Mm-hmm. Much as 1984, much as Clockwork Orange, much as we, they were satirizing the society that they were taking part in. The thing about Stan Zanzibar, <coughs> excuse me, and the Sheep Look Up is they are to environmental issues what a last Babylon was to nuclear war or on the beach. And I think um, I like to yes. call those books warning novels, right? And um, I definitely think that these books are warning novels. Now, for me specifically, The Sheep Look Up was a huge influence on, on my re- recent novel, The Ring, uh, Ring of Fire, uh, in a couple ways, kind of the format and the multi-character thing. But... Um, and Stan Zanzibar does that too. And I think one of the things that's really important about Stan Zanzibar and the Sheep Look Up that, that was an influence for me was that you have to look at multiple aspects of how society is being affected to really get a picture for what environmental damage is doing, right? Gotta have mm-hmm. multiple perspectives. And Stan and Zanzibar did it a little differently than the Sheep Look Up and and so for me, it was an influence in the sense of that I knew I couldn't just do this like um, Spielberg War of the World style where you just focus on one family. You, you have to see a kaleidoscope of effects. And I think Stan on Zanzibar just, you know, through that narrative structure and through that narrative style just really nailed it. So to, to wrap things up a little bit, um, Dwayne, like, how overall, like, how do you think Stan Zanzibar is going to be viewed? Here's an interesting question: In 2069, when it's a hundred years old, let's let's think about that for a minute. I know it's kind of hard to get your head around, but how how are we going to look back at this book as time progresses? I'm of the mind that people in 2069 will be looking at that and going, "Why the hell weren't we paying attention?" He was right. Exactly. Yeah, and look, and for people who just want a fun and crazy, I think, yes, I, I agree that that's how people are going to look at it, but this also, like, don't get bogged down in it being too intellectual, too, because there are, you know, mega computer brains, there's, psych- there's mass marketed psychedelics, eugenics, and all kinds of fun science fiction ideas. So it is a, as depressing as it sounds and as, as hard work as it sounds, there are lots of fun moments in this book for science fiction readers who like, like the weird stuff, you know? Oh yeah. I, it's great science fiction into the prophecy and all that. Cause Brunner didn't intend it to be prophetic. He was just relating as, as he saw it and issuing a polemic. If we keep going this way, this is what's going to happen. It's logical. Follow it step by step. And so he laid out the steps. Mm-hmm. All right. So, um, and then um, what are some other uh, related, either Brunner or environmental sci-fi that um, that you can recommend to pair with this book? And I'll do some. Um, directly related would be John Christopher's No Blade of Grass, 
Mm-hmm. Um, J.G. Ballard's Millennium, mm-hmm. Tom Dish's 334, all of which are ostensibly part of that overpopulation arc that Make Room, Make Room is part of. Yeah. Uh, there's, they're, and they're all from about the same time. And they're all just excellent. Dwayne, you just gave me a bunch of names for books I want to read. Um, I would also include some uh, Norman Spinrad, uh, his Greenhouse oh, yeah. Greenhouse Summer. Um, I'm really looking forward to I just got his um, novel about the AIDS crisis, the Journal of the Plague Years. I've never read that. Yeah, Spinrad had a lot of similar um, ideas. He had a, a novel called World Between that I re- remember had this really great like gender stuff going on. And uh-huh. yeah, and Spinrad is uh, one I'm a big fan of, and I know he endorsed this book, and he was like huge involved in the Hugo campaign for San Zanzibar. So, yes. Yeah, you know another one that a more modern uh, book that I would suggest for people, and it may not seem like a direct link. Brian Jeff Evans. Vandermeer. Oh yeah, Jeff Vandermeer, Annihilation, his trilogy. But I would also suggest Brian Evanson's Immobility. Great okay. book. Very underrated. The cli-fi movement is a big thing right now, and I just read a book called uh, Memory of Water, which is a really great climate change novel. The author is Emmy in in Toronto. Uh, Memory of Water, very very good. All right. Um, any closing thoughts on John Bruner, Stand on Zanzibar? I mean, we know we want everybody to read it, but um, anything else, Dwayne? Um, yeah, and I keep referring to how influential it has been, and I'm going to have to throw in a plug because I just started a book publishing company. Um, it's called Oxygen Man Books, and the iconography involves gas masks. I myself wear a cannula, so it has that level, but it's explicitly a reference to the sheep look up and stand on Zanzibar in the world that they created. Oh, very cool. Yeah, and, uh, yeah, so, uh, I'll give links to Dwayne's stuff in the show notes, but, um, we really appreciate people taking the time to listen to Stan, to us talk about Stan on Zanzibar. And, uh, we'll talk to you some other time. Dwayne, it was great having you. Um, you are a, a dickhead as well, right? Yes, I am. Yeah, well, we'll have to have you on for an episode talking about one of, you had a favorite PKD book? Martian Time Slope. Oh, hey, we're coming up on that. So maybe we'll do a bonus about Martian time slip. So you and me. Uh, (laughs) All right, dude. Uh, We'll talk soon. And thanks for listening, everybody. (laughs) 